So as a composer who's written for dozens of orchestras like the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the Minnesota Orchestra, and the New Jersey Symphony, I feel that I'm in a unique position to share my own methodology for how I tackle on one of the most misunderstood sections of this ensemble, the string section. Now to do this, I'm going to orchestrate one of Chopin's piano preludes for the string section of a symphony orchestra. But before we begin, we need to go over a few basic tenets of how a string section operates. The string section itself is most often divided into five distinct groups. The first violins, the second violins, the violas, the cellos, and the contrabasses. At its maximum size, we usually have 16 first violins, 14 second violins, 12 violas, 10 cellos, and 8 contrabasses. Now, big budget symphony orchestras like the Berlin Philharmonic, the New York Philharmonic, and the Los Angeles Philharmonic all use string sections at about this size. And it also happens to be the same size string section that I used to compose Ai Sheen, or Living in Arabic, for the Los Angeles Philharmonic late last year. And by the way, you can watch the full playlist about how that piece came to be down in the description below. Now on the other side of the spectrum, the usual minimum number of string players is five first violins, four second violins, three violas, two cellos, and one contrabass. String section sizes can also exist in the middle of that spectrum too. For example, I just finished writing this piece for the California Symphony, which is titled Mishwad, by the way, or Trip in Arabic, which uses 13 first violins, 11 second violins, nine violas, eight cellos, and six basses. So as you can see, as long as we have a descending number of instruments, as we go from the higher pitch to the lower pitched instruments, we should have a well-balanced string section. The next logical consideration is, where do the players actually sit? Now we most often find ourselves in one of two situations. The first and most common configuration, starting from the left-hand side of the conductor, are the first and second violins seated together. Right in front of the conductor are the violas. And to the right of the conductor, we have the cellos. The contrabasses stand or sit on high stools right behind the cellos. Now the second configuration features a more antiphonal setup with the first violin seated on the left-hand side of the conductor and the second violin seated at the right-hand side. The violas and the cellos fill the gap in between and the contrabasses would be right behind the second violins. Now, when I'm writing for an orchestra, I personally prefer to use the first configuration because I find I get a more confident and in-tune sounding string complement with all the violins sitting together. But there are plenty of examples in the repertoire that work well with the second configuration too. Now, an often overlooked part of string writing is knowing exactly where the physical music stands are within each section. Typically speaking, every pair of players shares one music stand. So for example, the concert master or in other words, the first chair player in the first violin section of an orchestra shares their stand with the second chair player in that same first violin section. The next stand is shared between the third and fourth chair players in that section. And this pattern continues all throughout the rest of the strings. In addition, the odd numbered player is typically called the outside player, while the even numbered player is called the inside player. Now this becomes important when there are moments in the music that call for divisi. When this happens, the players are tasked with the Dividing two simultaneous pitches amongst themselves. Now the way this typically gets solved is that the outside player takes on the top voice while the inside player takes on the bottom voice. And tangentially speaking, just so you know, the inside player also serves as the unofficial page turner of the pair, just in case you're wondering who tends to end up doing that job. And by the way, if you enjoy the videos I make on this channel and wanna go further with your composition studies, I do offer virtual one-on-one -on -one sessions, which you can book through my website, link down in the description below. Now my students are from all walks of life, from hobbyist composers learning the basic tenets of harmony and orchestration to ambitious students seeking admittance to the top universities in the world to study composition at the highest levels. So no matter who or where you are, I look forward to helping you improve as a composer. Now, let's get back to the video. All right, now that we've gone over the basic logistics of the string orchestra, let's now turn our attention to the task at hand, orchestrating the first couple bars of Chopin's Prelude Number no. 9, in E major. Now step one is to get a hold of the score, which you can easily find for free on imslp.org, which is a depository for thousands of works in the public domain. Step two is to listen to a recording while reading the score, which is what we're gonna do right now. Right, now that 
you've heard it, step three is to open up your notation software of choice. Today, I'm gonna to be using Sibelius. All right, now that we're in Sibelius, let's look at the setup of the score first before we dive in with the actual orchestration. On the very top, we have the title of the work, Preludes Opus 28, number nine, which is fairly standard. On the right-hand side, you'll see the composer's name, Frederick Chopin, and right below that, arranged by Saad Haddad. So this is very typical kind of writing in terms of the setup. Now, in terms of the actual setup of the instruments, what you wanna do from top to bottom is write out violin one, violin two, viola, violoncello, and contrabass. You can do this for any size orchestra. It doesn't matter if you have the full string section like you do in the New York Philharmonic or a very small string section like you would maybe on a film studio setup, for example. The important thing to notice though is that we have a bracket on the very left-hand side between the first and second violins. The other instrument here don't have a bracket at all. The first and second violins are notated in treble clef, the viola in alto clef, and the cellos on bass clef. Note that the contrabass is going to sound one octave lower than what is going to be written here. We'll dive into the contrabass later on. All right, now that we're done with the initial setup, let's take a look at the Chopin and see what other things that we can glean from. The first thing, we see that the key signature is in E major, so let's go ahead and change that first. So here I am in E major. That's easy to do. The next thing that I'm going to do is put in the time signature here. It's in common time. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. There we go. Common time. And the last kind of setup thing that we'll do is put the tempo. So here it's largo e grave. And I'm going to even put a BPM at the very top here as well. So let's see. Largo e grave. We can do quarter note equals 50. Quarter note equals 50. That seems nice and slow. Now that we've notated those elements, let's take a look at what the most obvious thing we're going to do here first. Now this melodic line, the piano, although it's notated in bass clef, is actually with in the range of the violins. The violin's lowest note is gonna be your G below middle C. That's also gonna be your lowest string on the violin. The other three strings on the violin, by the way, are D, A, and E. More on that later. So I'm gonna go ahead and notate this. So here I am, my B, B, B again, B, C sharp, and then going into our second bar right here. Let me zoom out a little bit. C sharp, D, D again, 16th note, D, D. Now I want to make sure that I have my dynamics in. So that's going to be forte. And then the next thing that I want to do is actually figure out what is going to be the articulation. I find that a lot of people put this at the very end. I don't really understand why. I feel like we really need to know what the character of each of these lines are going to be as we're writing them. I don't like to wait until the very end to put all these things down. So here we go. When I heard this pianist play this line, I heard actually kind of a more heavy feeling, duh. Da, 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 di, da, this kind of feeling. So I want them to be very heavy when I'm playing and connected, but not slurred in other words, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is actually, I'm gonna leave all these notes on their own. I'm not gonna put any slur marks because when you put a big slur mark, like what this composer, of course, Chopin did, this is not really a thing that violinists or any string player does. When you notate a slur like this, what you're telling the player to do is actually take their bow like this and continue playing it like this in one direction over the entire slur. So for example, when you have this first note B and then the next note B, guess what? You're not really gonna get an articulation when you get to that second note. The way you get that articulation is by changing bow. So you would have the B play first and then the B comes second. So you would hear the first B with one bow and the second B on the next bow. So in order to do that, I need to take off the slur completely. So let's do that right now. So I take the slur off, and now what I get is this kind of sound. Now, obviously I'm using a note performer four engine here. I'm not using a real violent sound, right? But the idea here is that you wanna make sure that you're getting the correct articulation for your orchestration as you're writing it in. Now, instead of doing any kind of articulation, what I'm gonna do actually is just put a couple of instructional words here so the violinists know exactly what to do. So in my case here, I'm gonna go and double click on this forte here and add a couple of words here. The first word being legato, which just means connected. And then I'm going to put A 
for and in Italian. And then I'm going to put this word here, pesante, which means heavy in Italian. So it drives home the fact that I want this to be connected as well as have a heavy stroke every time they play each of these notes in the melody. Now, the next thing that I'm going to want to do is figure out what to do with the bass line. So here it feels fairly obvious that this line should go in the contra bass part first. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to put the E here, the B here, the E here, the A here. Of course, we need to make that a dotted eighth note. G sharp, 32nd note. F sharp as a half note. And then we have our B one octave down, and then we want to put this B up here like so. Oh, this is going to be a doubly dotted B, and then another B here. Now notice how I am putting these pitches one octave higher than what we see in the piano. That's very much done on purpose. In fact, when the contra bass players are playing these pitches that you see here, what's actually happening is that you're hearing these pitches down one octave. So in fact, when you want to write a pitch for the contra bass, always think, okay, I got to write one octave higher in the staff itself. And again, we're going to have to put our dynamics in our articulation. So I'm gonna do the same exact thing, actually. I'm gonna take this forte, legato e pesante. I'm gonna copy and paste that right here. And this should actually help me a lot in terms of the style of the playing here. So here I can do this whole thing where I'm going B, or rather it'll be down here. B, do, D, D, do, D, do, bum. So there are a couple of things here that I want to change. Of course, I want this beam, boom, boom. That's very good. But then when I get to this doubly dotted eighth note, B da da. I don't really want to have that 30 second note re-articulated that fast. That seems to be a little bit messy, just changing the bow that quickly. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to put my slur here. So now I'm going to actually utilize that slur and put it on top there. So now he's going to go B da da. And of course, if I'm playing the contra bass, it'd be like this D da da. So now that G sharp is underneath the slur. It's underneath one bow along with the A. And it's going to be a lot more smooth than if I just articulated these two notes separately. So I'm very happy with that. This very ending thing, though, I can't necessarily do that, right? I can't have both these notes necessarily under one bow in this kind of context. So I'm going to leave it as is. And hopefully the player will know that I want this to be similarly phrased as this because the nature of the phrase calls for that. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is figure out what to do with these inner voices, the second violins, the violas, and the cellos. Okay. Typically speaking with a contra bass part, you're going to want to hear the contra bass in octaves with the cello, especially in a very functionally tonal passage such as this one. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this line here and copy paste it into the cello line one octave above where it's indicated. So as you can see here, when I copy paste the contra bass line to the cello line, you see it down an octave from where you see it in the contra bass. This is actually gonna be the same exact sound. So when I play these back to back, you'll notice that it's the same exact pitch. When I put this up an octave from where you see it, it's gonna be in octaves with the contra bass. So listen to this. Now we hear it in octaves. Now that we've finished with these three lines, I'm starting to see a problem. See if you can see it with me. When I look at the original Chopin here, right, we see these E's and octaves that we put here, and then we see that melodic line. Okay, we took care of that. But then look at this inner voice here in the bass clef. We have E, B, and then E. So if we kept this B at this octave, look, it crosses into what the cello is doing right here, which I don't really want to do because I like having that B separated from what the inner voices are doing. So I'm going to have to change a couple of things actually here to make this thing work. So now I'm thinking about taking the cello and contra bass lines and taking them down about an octave so that I can leave room for these inner voices to flourish along with this first violin melody. So stick with me here. Watch what I'm about to do. So what I'm going to do is take this entire thing Thing that's in E major, and I'm going to transpose this up a minor second to F major. And I'm going to make sure that I change the key signature as well to F major. And then after I do that, I'm going to take this line here in the contra bass in the cello and move it down an octave. So now look at this. In the cello line, we have F, C, F, B flat, A, G. C, C. 
which is within the range of the cello. If I didn't transpose it up a minor second, this C would be a B, which is not possible on the cello with its open strings being C, G, D, and A. Now in the contrabass, you'll see that there's a little red here on the C string. Most string bass players in professional orchestras are gonna have this C on their double bass. So normally speaking, in the double bass, we would have E, A, D, and G as your four strings that are open on the instrument. But with the C string extension on the double bass, we can get down to this very low C. So that's the C that we're gonna end up using in this arrangement. And with that in mind, now we can finally use these inner voices where they're seated in the original Chopin. So now I'm going to go ahead and put this line here, keeping note of the transposition. So here we are with E natural. So that means we're gonna have F. Now we gotta make sure that it's in the right area here. So this E, which is transposed to F, is in the bass clef. So actually this F is gonna be down an octave here. Then I wanna get the next note which would be B but this B is going to be up a minor second to this C. Now notice that if we kept this at pitch according to what Chopin wanted in the viola this is kind of a byproduct of what we did here we would actually not be able to play this note because on the viola the lowest notes are going to be C like we'll be here here G D and A as I've written out here. Now the C is gonna be the lowest possible pitch. So of course we couldn't get the B. So let's go back and do this whole thing. So F, C, and then we have E again, but we're gonna transpose it up a second to F. And then we're gonna see that we need a D sharp transposed up to E. Then we need the B transposed up to C, but we gotta make this a triplet. So E, C, E. And now we have an E that needs to be transposed up to F. Then we have the B that's transposed up to C. Then again, we have the E transposed up to F. So I'm gonna go ahead and do all of that for you right now. All right, now that we put all the viola notes in, I wanna actually hear this back. Of course, we're gonna put in that forte that we put in the other voices. And I wanna hear this back and figure out what should the articulation be. So let's hear this. Okay, so I don't think it should be legato and pesante the same way the others are, because otherwise I would just have B, B, D, 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 D. I don't think I want that. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna experiment with putting a slur on every three pitches like this, and that way I can get more of a D, 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 kind of more connected sound across the three triplets. So I'm gonna go ahead and try doing that. And I think we're gonna be happier with that kind of sound because it will be more connected across the three pitches. Now, you don't need to do it exactly like this. Another possible way to do it is actually bowing across six pitches. So that's a possibility as well. So don't think that there's only one way to do this. That's another possible approach as well. But I'm gonna go ahead and stick to doing one slur every three triplets. Now we're gonna run into a problem here because this second voice here is a G sharp and it continues on with the third triplet over here. But here in this third voice, which we assign to the viola, you'll notice that we have a B down here, which isn't reciprocated in any way in the second voice here. So we're going to have to figure out what to do about that. And you'll see that this kind of pattern continues all the way through these two measures. So there's a couple of ways that we're going to experiment with this, okay? So first, I'm just going to write it as is. So this would be a G sharp that's going to be transposed up a minor second. So we have this A, then I'm gonna leave this as a rest because there's nothing there, and here this A again. So that's gonna be our first iteration there. Then I'm just gonna copy paste that rhythm because that's what we see in this second part over here. And here we see an F sharp, okay, so that's gonna be G natural. And then the next thing that we're gonna see is an F sharp, and then we're gonna do a G natural again. Notice how this transposition that we did from E major to F major helps a lot because this F sharp, by the way, would not have been possible if I left it as is. So transposing is a really good thing to do, especially when you're orchestrating four strings. Again, remember on the violin, we have G, D, A, and E. It looks like this G, D, A, and then the top one would be this pitch over here. Okay, so let's continue on and do the rest of these things. So that's gonna be A, B,
All right, I have to be honest, I'm not really that happy with the way this is laid out as presently constructed. The reason, I want this second violin and the viola part to be more like what is gonna be heard in the original piano part. To me, it seems like this viola and second violin part should act more as a unit, like it does in the piano part. Right now, it doesn't feel like it's gonna be a unified thing at all. You're gonna have these two pitches playing together, then no sound at all here, so like half the sound is leaving this inner voice when we get to this rest, which I don't want at all. And then we have another attack here and then another attack right here. And this continues on with the rest of the two measures. So I don't really want this to happen. So there are two things that we're gonna have to decide. Okay, the first thing is, do we want this to be longer? So that's one thing that we can do. And of course, we're gonna copy paste this forte legato e pesante here. I think that's what we're gonna do here. And I should have just put that here as well in the viola so we can keep it consistent. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that here as well. And I'm gonna space this out a little bit so we can see all the parts a little bit better. I think that this is one possible way. So if I just kind of take a look and see what is happening here, it would look like this D, 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 okay? This is the kind of the way that they'll be playing it. Now that's one way to do it. I think it is a possible avenue. The other thing that we could do is just ignore this second note entirely and just take it off. So I can just have it like this, delete the triplet here and just put the A as a quarter note. Then I'll take the next one and just make this a G quarter note instead of having those rhythms there. So that way, actually, I bypass having to attack on that second triplet here, because as you can see with the viola here, the viola player is bowing that third note. So this avoids having the second violin having to bow against what the viola articulation is. So actually, I kind of prefer this. That way you see that there is a unified bowing action happening between the second violin here and the viola here. The next time they both bow is going to be together. It's going to be here with the second violin and here with the viola. I actually really like this because it helps make sure that the first violin melody stands out above what the inner voices are doing. So let's go ahead and finish this out. All right, so that's the entire arrangement. Let's take a listen to what this sounds like in Note Performer 4. All right, so that's one possible way of doing this fairly simple orchestration. I will see you next time.